If you're an attorney that struggles with getting home in time for dinner or taking a vacation without your cell phone and your laptop attached to your hip, or maybe you just can't figure out why you don't make more money based on your education level and the service that you give to your clients. Maybe you're an attorney who wonders, why can't my law firm operate without my constant presence? Or finally, maybe you're thinking to yourself, I wonder if I can ever retire from my firm. Maybe I'm gonna have to work right to my dying day like so many other attorneys before me have done. Well, hi, my name is Richard James and I created EA Nation so that you could learn how to build a law firm that supports your lifestyle as compared to undermining your lifestyle. EA Nation stands for Entrepreneurial Attorney Nation and we join together with other like-minded entrepreneurial attorneys to unpack the secrets to how to do just that. And I wanna help you build your law firm better one system at a time. So without further ado, let's get started with this next episode. Uh, welcome to this month's interview with an expert call. I'm Richard James, and today we're gonna to be talking about the checklist selling. And I'm excited about that as some housekeeping, uh, just towards the end of the year here, we're, at, we're in December. Uh, our office is closed the week between Christmas and New Year. Uh, if there's any team members listening to this, uh, I don't mean to make you feel bad if your office isn't closed between Christmas and New Year. It's just one of those things we decided to do uh, for our team years ago, and it's worked, and it gives them, uh, all of us, including them, a way to refresh and restart. Uh, we have the Partners Club meeting that's coming up around the corner in February, uh, and that is going to be uh, a fantastic event that's focused around profit. Uh, I'm going to be there. We have guest uh, presenters from the membership that is going to be sharing with it, with you how they maximize their profit, stuff you don't really want to miss. Tom Rich is going to be talking about generating profit uh, from his perspective as a small business owner and a longtime uh, small business consultant. So I think there's uh, tremendous content there as well as wonderful marketing uh, and networking opportunities. And so you're going to want to make sure that if you not use your golden ticket, you go ahead and, and do that. This is a great event to do so. If you're a member and you haven't registered yet, go ahead and fill out the RSVP form uh, that we need you to register. Um, I'm going to go ahead and change my um, uh, Brittany to a co-host so that she can have the uh, superpowers that I need her to have. There you go, Brittany. I'll also change Michael to a co-host so that he can have superpowers as well. All right. So now as we start to get populated, as we're moving towards a few minutes after four, we're going to get started with the uh, live content. So as we, as we do the interview with an expert, I try to bring you uh, information from experts that, are, that we know get results. So oftentimes the experts that I interview our sponsors that we have in our Partners Club program, and the only way they can be sponsors, they can't write a check, um, they have to actually get results. And so um, when, when you start uh, thinking about getting results, like how do you define it? Well, it's, it's usually defined in helping our clients succeed in the goals that they hired them to help them with. Um, for me, in this particular guest situation, it goes back a little farther, right? So as a, as a small business consultant for the last you know, decade or more, um, I have worked with small businesses one-on-one. -on -one, and oftentimes I find uh, they would ask me questions about how to do things. And then when I, uh, when I would tell them, you know, here's what you should do, X, Y, and Z, uh, when I saw them next, I would find that they either didn't implement or they only implemented part of it. And as my son was growing up wanting to be in business, he would ask me questions and I would give him advice and, and tell him what to do. And then he would go ahead and he would implement it. And so um, I found that like, I would tell him something to do on a Friday and by Saturday morning when I woke up, it was kind of already done, right? So he implemented a really high level. And if you've been around our world at all, you know that Michael and I did an interview back in December, probably three or four years ago, when we talked about YouTube marketing and he had built a successful YouTube channel. Uh, with, you know, 60, 70, 80,000 subscribers that, you know, gave him a six-figure income every year while he went through college, and he was very successful at it. Over the last year, uh, as Michael has matured, now graduated college, and he and I talked about what we were going to do together next, we decided to launch a business together. And after looking at, you know, quite frankly, dozens and dozens of different businesses, we decided that what he was most passionate about and what I was passionate about was this idea of getting real meaningful change in the consult room or the sales room. And what he, the name we came up with was the closing room. 
And so um, I'll let him tell you his story and how he came about it. But what, the best testimony I can give you to Michael is not only does he, is he an action taker, so he's a small business owner, so understands how to take action and get results. He, he's now fil- figured out a formula that works. And so today we're going to share with you that formula. Um, and, and, and it's really a, a, a 30,000 foot view, which I think is important for you to hear as to why you need to think about things this way. Uh, and hopefully you'll have some questions. So if you have questions, we're gonna use the chat. If you wouldn't mind, go ahead and um, use the chat to just tell me you can hear me and you can see and you're here or just say good afternoon or good morning if it's morning in your world, just whatever, just tell me hello in the chat. So I know you know how to use it. Go ahead and type something in the chat for me. Anything, I don't care, say hello, say good. There you go, thanks Steve. Okay, so uh, at least I know this is working. I haven't been talking into a vacuum. Um, so, um, now what we're going to do is as you have questions, as you go through this, Brittany's on, so she'll be looking for your questions. And if there's anything you asked as we went through it and didn't get to it right away, we'll get to it by the time, uh, we finish today, Michael and I will make sure we get all of your questions answered. Um, so, uh, Michael, without further ado, why why don't you say hello? Are you there? You're unmuted. I'm here. I appreciate it. Thank you for the opportunity to be on. I'm obviously excited. Uh, it's sales, so who shouldn't be excited, right? Um, but yeah, so, yes, I am here. Good. So, what are we? Gonna, what's the title of like this generate with this concept of what we're going to talk about today? What would you call it? Uh, well, the overall title is ultimately how checklist selling can generate you one hundred and fifty eight thousand seven hundred and forty four dollars in only six weeks. Okay, that's a very specific number. Where did that number come from? Uh, that number came from someone that's in our program. Uh, they are excelling and they excelled pretty rapidly. Okay, and so today, this is not going to be a pitch about your program. We're going to try to give them real value and, and really how to think about this different, right? Yeah, absolutely. This is uh, pure value, some big ticket items that they could take and immediately implement. So we know everybody on the call because of who we, we work with around here is going to be small business owners who happen to choose law as the business they offer. So or attorneys who own small law firms. But who else is this kind of information for? What, what is this really designed to help? Who is this designed to help? Yeah, I mean, ultimately, the information in today's uh, training is designed to help people that are maybe not where they'd like to be in the, in, in the consult room. Maybe they're not closing at a, a high percentage or a percentage they know they're capable of. Maybe it's someone that's looking to replace themselves in the consult room and they're looking for that transition and what that looks like and how they can make that happen. Um, But ultimately, someone that's looking to increase the results in the consult room while also either looking to replace themselves and or even generate more money down when we're at time of consult. Okay, good. So uh, while we're here today, what are they what are you going to what are we going to talk about? What are you going to reveal to them? In the next 45 minutes, 60 minutes. Yeah. So over the next 45 to 60 minutes, um, we're going to cover how to generate clients on demand while ultimately learning how to do so while removing yourself from the consult room, regardless of if that seems like a ridiculous thought right now or not, Uh, how to attract the exact clients you want to work with, but more importantly, how to command a premium price while doing that. And then lastly, we're going to touch on the importance of how to leverage your time. And if you are looking to make that transition, how to make that happen and why that's such an important next step to leveraging your time. Cool. Uh, yeah, those are all important topics. Uh, let, we'll break into them, I guess, one by one. Let's, let's, uh, let me get to my notes and we'll get right to it. Um, so um, I, I guess it's said differently. These things that you're going to talk about today are going to lead them to this ultimate promise of if they implement these things, they too can experience $157,000 and some odd change of increased value. Is that, is that the general, I know you, you can't make a promise of that, but sure. is that the general premise? Yeah. The general premise is by implementing what you learn in today's training, you're, you're able to take it and generate a return on that. You're able to increase the amount of gross sales you generate as a result of today's content. So let's talk about, um, let's get to the nitty gritty to make sure we try to get to some emotional connection, right? So uh, what is it that, you know, as we're talking to the folks that are here today and they're wondering if if this is relevant to them, what are some of the folks who don't do what you know how to do? What are they, what are they struggling with? What are they going through? 
Yeah, I, I mean, there, there's obviously a lot of struggles that I see come through. Um, some folks are struggling to meet payroll because they don't have consistent cases coming into the firm. Uh, you've got other firms that the owner's losing sleep because they know they have to wake up and generate new clients, but they also have to balance the entire operation of their law firm, right? Um, you, you've got firms that are getting some of the components down, but you, you know they're, they're, not, they're not charging enough. And they're afraid that if they raise their rates, they're not going to have people actually pay them, right? Um, or just the fact that you're just sick and tired of working way too hard on the business to feel like you're not moving anywhere. You're just staying stagnant. I would say those are the folks, those are the struggles that I, I really see come through. And if you're not implementing what we're already preaching in today's content, um, I, I would say they're likely relatable to some of you. So um, it's fair to say, though, those are like those are the symptoms, right? That's yes. not that's not the real problem. What's the real problem? Yeah. So the real problem at hand is that the same people, they, they haven't made the shifts. They haven't yet made the shifts that they need to make to get out of that situation. Uh, so how are there how many shifts are there? There's five shifts that you need to make to be able to remove yourself from that situation and get to the other side of that. Okay. Um, I want to know what the shifts are, but uh, what, what, uh, so let's say they make these, these shifts we're going to talk about. Yeah. Um, what, what happens then? Yeah. The other side, what does the other side look like? Um, well, for starters, uh, you'll have complete control to generate the exact clients you want uh, to work with on demand, right? Being able to generate clients on demand. Uh, you'll be able to command premium prices for the services uh, that you uh, provide. You're going to realize that your law firm can change, which is beautiful news. And you'll finally generate the income you've wanted to generate, but more importantly, while regaining your time and your freedom, and I'd say the most important part to a lot of us is you'll be able to do all of this while tapping back into the excitement you first had when starting your law firm. Hmm. Well, that sounds pretty sexy. Okay, yeah. um, so uh, why? let's talk about you. So I gave you a, a resounding uh, endorsement as my son, sure. um, but, but I, you know, the pain in the rear end dad that I am, um, just like when we were late for practice at baseball, I made you do push-ups, and I did them with you. Um, mm -hmm. I I said if you're going to do this, you got to prove yourself, right? So why don't you tell everybody, just in case they don't know, sure. um, why why should they listen to you? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Well, like you said, I you know I had to go prove myself. I had to take the the structure that he had originally created, right? And and there was however many steps, 57 steps, whatever it was. And, and I, I looked at Come that. On, sales, it wasn't that bad. It wasn't <laughs> I, that <it's> questionable, bad. <laughs> questionable. <laughs> so I had to take all of those steps and figure out how to dial it in and boil it down to a much more simplistic, easy to follow system, which is what we have now called the 19 steps. So I boiled down those 19 steps and we found a alpha firm. Would you like me to use names or no names? Yeah, you can tell everybody they're okay with it, I think. Well, okay. I mean, you know better than I do, but I'm assuming they're okay with it. They, they are okay with it. So uh, the, the Grafton firm was gracious enough to allow us to go in as an alpha client and uh, give me an opportunity to, to, to prove out this structure, to see if we've got something here, right? So I, I went into the Grafton firm and uh, I, I watched Will run consultations for, uh, for whatever, a week to, to see kind of how he did things. And he was very set in the way he did things. And, and, and that was fine. And I said, okay, well now, now give me 90 days and let's try these 19 steps. Let me run this structure on every consultation every single time. Okay. And so when we went in, uh, the, the Graftons were closing around 55 to, to 60%. That was about the close rate, the higher rate. Uh, and then at the end of those 90 days, we were consistently closing at 83%, which was very exciting. Uh, but I quickly realized that I'm not going to be the one in each firm running consultation, right? So I had to then say, okay, can I take what I just did here with the Graftons and can I show other firms how to do that too? And so we brought some beta clients in and I created the initial founding blocks of this program and, and started 
teaching the 19 steps and teaching how to implement it. And they had fantastic results. And fast forward over the past six to eight months now, we've now had um, a variety of clients um, doing just north of about $2 million in additional gross sales since the program started as a result of everyone increasing their hire rate. Fabulous. Okay. Got it. So you've got the chops, you figured out how to do it yourself. You, you, you train somebody, then you train somebody else how to do it. Uh, and, and now you, you've brought on a swath of clients and you've been doing it math. So, okay, fine. We can, we believe you, but sure. so you, you've got these 19 steps we, we, in 40 minutes. We're not going to be able to go through 19 steps, but right. and nor, nor will it do much value. I think right. one of the interesting things that you said to me was, Hey dad, um, while, while obviously we have 19 steps that we have to follow, um, there, there were five shifts and this is kind of how this came about. There were five shifts that took place. How did you discover these five shifts when you were going like, what, what how did that come about? Cause you started with like 19 steps and now here you are, you identified like five things that, that your clients weren't doing that you n- realized needed to be done. And, and so how did you figure that out? Sure. So I think it's a conversation of more the macro and the micro. So the, the micro is the 19 steps. That's the, the practical everyday implementation of being able to increase your hire rate. But on a macro level, I saw a common trend with just about every firm that came into the program. And these are five macro shifts that I discovered every firm had to make to be able to come to the other side of those challenges we discussed earlier on to get to the point of uh, tapping back into that excitement. Okay, good. Well, let's talk about shift one. I think you sent them to me. Let me let me see if I bring it up here. All right, so there it is, 144, and it's the five shifts. And the first shift you want to talk about is, go ahead, I'll let you walk through it here. Yeah, uh, shift one is implementing a repeatable sales system. Okay, so it's important that we implement a repeatable sales system. We could slide over. Um, So when it comes to implementing a repeatable sales system, uh, this is important because, see, if you don't have a system, you don't have a structure, it's going to be extremely difficult to ever build consistency into your consult room, right? And without consistency, there's no dependability. And without dependability, uh, you're going to experiencing our experience all of the problems we had discussed earlier. And it's going to be hard to ever truly achieve freedom in your firm. So this one thing, implementing a repeatable sales system, actually has a ripple effect to everything else in our firm. Because if we put a proven structure that can be used on every consultation every single time, um, it will allow us to generate predictable, and consistent results in the consultation room. And the important point to make is it does not matter whether this system is run by you, the attorney, the owner, an attorney, or a non-attorney, right? It does not matter whether it is an attorney, the owner, or a non-attorney salesperson. The key is we need to have a repeatable sales system that should have no deviation and should be run on every consultation without fail. Okay, so so get tell me if I'm wrong. I'm hearing this as a mindset issue. Like I'm hearing this as not like, you know, okay, Michael, we heard you, we need a system. But like, sure. I'm hearing you say, you, you find that the attorneys that, the, the owners of small law firms that don't have the mindset that they are going to use a closed loop, repeatable system every single time are the ones that struggle to get repeatable amount of clients and maximize their conversion rate. Is that correct? Yeah. And, and that, that is correct. And the reason, in in, in other words, in other words, what I mean is they think that they need to go build a system or change the system every time to, to get as many percentages, the highest percentage of clients they can, the way they'll maximize their client percentage is if they uniquely use a, a, a unique situation each and every call or each and every meeting. Yeah, and when you ultimately boil it down, it boils down to two, two things. One, for so long, so many people have been told that you do need to customize each consultation to each prospect. And indirectly by saying that, you nailed it. 
that you should try to close 100% of the deals that come through your firm's doors, right? Here's the problem with that. Some weeks, you might close 80% of the deals that walk through the firm. Other weeks, you might close 20%. And the problem is without a structure and building each uh, consultation to customize it for each prospect, you have no dependability. There, there's no consistency to that. So you never know week by week how you're going to close. And the other problem is many attorneys that are listening to this, I completely understand why, they get bored with the idea of having a closed loop system, right? It, there, it, it, there's no fun. There's no variety. There's no customization of catering to each prospect. And so it gets boring to them. And to be fair, it is boring and it's supposed to be boring because it's supposed to consistently close in a range of varies per practice area, but 65 to 75%. We're not trying to go for 100% of the cases that walk through the door. We're trying to close a considerable percentage at a consistent rate. Yeah, that's very interesting. So it's like a lot of attorneys, what they love about meeting with clients is the unique challenge that each client brings and their ability to craft a creative solution for everybody right there on the fly and use their wit and their legal knowledge to be able to not only show them how smart they are, but feel good about the fact that there's no legal problem inside of this scope of practice area that they can't handle, right? Um, and, sure. and listen, I get that. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I get that. Like, I, I I'm the guy that stands on stage without a net, right? And is going, okay, throw your challenges at me. And, and I'm going to come up with this creative solution each and every time. So I understand the thrill of that, sure. right? And, mm -hmm. and, and in, in, in the product delivery, which my events would be product or service delivery, that's okay. But what you're saying is in the sales room or the closing or the console or whatever we're going to call it, in, in that process, there is no room for creativity. That is correct. We need a formula. We need a structure, a structure that closes consistent numbers. Okay. All right. Do uh, you have anybody that, that you thought the one way and now thinks a different way? You got a story about that? Uh, sure. And so I, I, we had a firm that joined the program. I'll use names. All the names I'm using are names that I have already been approved to use. Uh, so attorney Michael Doyle, uh, he originally came into the, to the program. He really didn't have a structure, right? He didn't have a structure. He didn't even necessarily want to use a structure. Uh, when we had our original conversation, he was then open to the idea of using a structure, but wanted to try to implement it on his own. He wanted to try to build his own structure, his own system. And I said, go for it. You know, that was one of your options. Do it yourself. And he wanted to try to do it himself. And I followed up with him a few months later. Uh, and I said, how's it coming along? You know, have you seen progress? How's your new system? Uh, and what he told me is... <laughs> He didn't have a system because it was boring. <laughs> and so once he told me that, I said, okay. And I said, how about your, your percentage? Have you increased the hire rate? No. In fact, I think it lowered. All right. So are we open to giving this a go? Yeah, let's give it a go. Right. And so then he implemented the system. He was closing around the 25% mark. And uh, after implementing the structure uh, within about four to six weeks, he was consistently closing at about 70%. And he's been in the program, and I don't think that number has changed since. Is it safe to say Michael's probably still bored saying the same thing over and over again? Yeah, I'd say it's safe to say, but uh, he has turned into an advocate for a structure now. Okay, good. good. All right, let's, let's keep going. Let's see if we can get to the next uh, shift here. Sure. Um, so the next shift is command premium pricing. Now, this, this is a sensitive topic because mm -hmm. uh, this is one of those areas, depending on practice area, they feel like um, the bar association, the trustee, yep. the judge, somebody mm -hmm. uh, controls what they can charge. And in some cases, they literally control what they can yes. charge. Um, and, and in others, they, they really fear that, you know, whether it was law school or just good old fashioned fair play, they feel like, well, if every other attorney in town is charging on average of $1,200, I should kind of charge $1,200 too, because that must be what the going rate is. 
what are, what are you finding inside of this? What, why is this shift so important? Yeah. Um, so this shift is vital. I, I would say uh, a couple of things. Obviously, yes, in some capacities, you are restrained on, on what you could charge. But I would say I like to err on the side of uh, I'd rather beg for forgiveness than ask for permission. Right. Mm -hmm. And secondly, I think in some cases, to be blunt and transparent, that is occasionally an excuse for not wanting to raise your rates because one of two reasons here, either one, you believe your expertise is not worth the rate that you would like to charge, or two, you think it is worth that rate, but you believe if you end up charging more that you're not going to have anyone to pay for it, right? So let's address problem one there. Okay. And let's go ahead and shift over. Um, so it's important to kind of reframe our mindset on commanding premium pricing, right? Because we're not selling our time per se, right? We're selling the value. It's not our time. It's not even our knowledge. It's the value of the result you delivered. Someone came into your firm with a problem that they are experiencing in some capacity and they need it solved. You are the solution to making sure their problem gets solved. And that's ultimately what your clients want. A lot of times they want clear communication, but they're not entirely concerned with what happens from A to B, as long as B means that their problem is solved and they no longer have to experience that pain. So high prices, believe it or not, actually reassure your client that you're the best at what you do. And so this is why it's important to reframe our mindset, our mindset on the thought of commanding and charging a premium price for what you do. Yeah, I want to unpack two, those two things you just said real quick. So you said um, it's not about the hours uh, and the labor or the knowledge. It's about the value. And so, um, yeah, I completely agree with you. Um, and let's define value for a second. So. Sure. You can define value in a couple of different ways. We can mm -hmm. define value at, as money at a discount. So, you know, if in a bankruptcy, it's pretty straightforward. You've got, you know, $127,000 in debt and you're going to pay me $2,500 and we're going to get rid of it. If every time you gave me $2,500, I gave you $100,000 back, how many times would you like to do that deal, right? I mean, that's a pretty straightforward, but it doesn't, it's not always that cut and dry, right? It's no. not, and, and in every practice area, it's not always that cut and dry. But what we're really talking about in value is, and, and here's where I think, I, and I just had a conversation with somebody else today uh, who had a 911 call earlier, earlier about this. And I think this is where attorneys are missing it. The real value is the hell that the clients that they're dealing with are going through, right? Yes. So the absolute torturous hell that they are struggling with. Yep. And the potential heavenly solution that they can provide if they were to retain the firm to do that for them. And what I think where attorneys miss is they don't let clients go deep enough into their hell and they don't let them articulate what their heaven would look like. And, and if they would do that, they would recognize that price elasticity would happen instantaneously because people will pay anything within reason right. to get out of hell and move towards heaven. Would you agree with that? Am I, am I saying that right? I, that's spot on. Couldn't have said it better myself. Okay. And now the second point that you made is, is what? Let's come back to that second point. So let's unpack that a little bit. So that was this idea that they, you, the higher prices actually reassure that they're with the right firm. In other words, said differently, if I need surgery on my knee, am I really going to fly to Mexico and go with an unknown entity that I can't do any research on just because I'm going to pay a tenth of the price that I would pay my orthopedic surgeon in Pennsylvania or Ohio or Arizona or wherever? Am I really going to do that to save a buck? Probably not. Maybe for my knee? Would I would I do it for my liver? Like what? Like what? At what point will I not want to save a buck to 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 make sure I want to make sure I'm paying the right value to the right person because I believe they're an expert, right? Mm -hmm. Do you think that you're you're basically saying there is an association with cheap 
and value pricing. Is that correct? Yeah. And it's something that I could assure you, I'm sure everyone on this training has experienced in some capacity. You see something for cheap and you see something that's expensive. The expensive thing happens to be associated with the best person to do that. And the cheap thing is with someone that may not accomplish what you need accomplished in the way you'd like it accomplished. Yeah, I'd go a step farther. Like those those attorneys who are out there, those owners of small business businesses that are out there that are, that are advertising on price and claiming to be the best, they're lying. Mm-hmm. Be, because and and you don't say this because you don't get into this, but I do, which is the profit and loss statement, right? So I know. I know for a fact what it costs to put a case out the door in just about every practice area. I know what it costs to acquire a case from marketing. When I put the, how much it costs to put a case out the door in labor hours and and actual cost of overhead, and I put what it costs to acquire the case in marketing and advertising, and it's not just me and, and, and I've got a staff and I've got a, I've got an actual business. Well, when I look at that, I go, if I charge any less than those two money numbers combined, we're losing money on every case. And if we're losing money on every case, there's no way in God's green earth we could have the right amount of resources to be able to allow clients um, to, to, to be able to experience good, excellent service. That we, they'll never get their phone calls responded to in time. Um, we'll never be able to hit our deadlines the way we're supposed to hit them. They're always gonna feel like we're running up against the last minute. We're not gonna be prepared when they show up they're going to they're going to feel like we're just teetering on the edge they're going to feel they're not going to really know the truth but they're not going to feel like they got this level A quality service because we don't have the resources to be able to give it to them if we don't charge the right prices now that's my perspective your perspective you don't you're not about that in the council room because you don't want to go there right you don't you don't ever go there but it's the truth right if you don't charge the right price you can't serve them well yeah. And so we may not necessarily in the consult room break it down on a business scale and what it looks like from a business owner's perspective, but you certainly can use relatable stories from other people that have tried to go down the cheap path and then end up at your firm's doors because they weren't being served properly and being able to relay those stories back in a relatable way. Yeah. So the other thing, the other thing I want to address with that is, is no, we can't, on, we're, we're not going to be able to um, tell them exactly what's going on uh, inside of the business. But here's the truth. If, if you don't charge the right price and you can't have the resources in place to serve the clients well, and they actually take the, all the other things that you tell them to do, like the 19 steps or checklist selling or anything else, and they do it and they're successful, but they, but they don't charge the right price, they're just going to speed up the pace at which everybody finds out they're not very good at what they do because there's no way to be, to grow and grow at an inexpensive rate. There's just no way. The only way to do that is if you're Tesla or is if you're Uber or is if you're some other publicly traded company that's got everybody else's cash going towards it. That's funding the loss day in and day out. Guess what? I don't have a VC company back in me. I don't know about you guys, but I don't have a VC company back in me, which means if I lose money, I lose my own money, which means if we run out of cash, I can't pay my employees, right? If you, if the only way this modern day image of charging cheap and growing rapidly works is in a VC funded world where they're just looking for the exit on the stock market to be able to get their value out that way. That's the only way it works. And it's, I think it's the most destructive thing to happen to small business because they've convinced small business they're supposed to do the same thing too. That's not the case. We need to charge the right price. And for all the reasons you and I have laid out here, I get it. It sounds like I'm really passionate about this because I am, because there's so many scumbags, forgive me, out there preaching that the way lawyers should grow their firm is to charge the least price. And, and they, are, they are the most destructive advisors to small businesses, specific, specifically small law firms that I've ever met. Because they're going to undermine that individual's lifestyle, their profitability, and their ability to be able to maintain the staff that they brought on and fundamentally serve clients. I can tell you that I watched the number one filer in the firm that we were competing against in Phoenix charge the least price. And they were the number one filer because they charged the least price. And I said, give it time. They'll be out of business. And within three years, they were gone filed bankruptcy themselves because they were underpricing their services and couldn't understand why there was no money left. So that's my soapbox. Sorry. We, maybe, no, it, 
do you, by I, the way, do you have anybody you talked to that anybody you worked with that went from whatever they were charging to what they're charging now? Yeah, and, and, and you're spot on with everything you said, and it's a very reasonable soapbox because if everyone continues to heal that advice, um, one day they're going to wake up without cash, with unsatisfied clients, and they're going to be in a position where they wish they would have just ultimately raised their rates. That's ultimately what's going to happen. But yes, when we go into an experience, I have uh, uh, Tim Stickrad, Tim Peggy um, from uh, Michigan, their bankruptcy firm. And when they originally came into our program, they were undercharging for a chapter seven. Uh, and he felt like that. I told him he was. And ultimately, what he decided to do was implement the structure, participate in the program. He increased his rate for a chapter seven. Uh, and here's the cool news. Once he increased his rate for chapter seven, th this is really cool. I love this story. Um, within three weeks, uh, one, their higher rate jumped about 15%. Uh, but not only that, they increased the fee by 20%. And more importantly, they actually gained market share. That's the cool story. Not only did they increase their higher rate, increase the amount they charged for a chapter seven, but they gain market share while doing it. And to be fair, this is while the bankruptcy market was going down. Correct. Right. So it's not like they're, they were doing this during the high times of bankruptcy. This is recently. Like this is in the last, whatever, nine months, right? Yeah. Yeah. This is in the last six months. Six months. Okay, cool. Yeah. All right. Let, let's, let's keep going. Let's get to the, let's sure. get to the third shift here. So let's yeah. uh, shift, shift three. three here. Let's see what do we got. So we've got checklists selling right checklist selling so yeah the secret weapon what you you call this your secret weapon okay so talk me through it what, what what is it you got going on because of what what's so powerful about this checklist selling it sounds sexy but why is it so powerful ultimately checklist selling is so powerful because we talk about implementing a repeatable structure right but what's the practical implementation of that the practical implementation of that is checklist selling. Having a structure and that structure being the checklist. In our case, it's the 19 steps, right? But by implementing checklist selling, which ultimately implements a repeatable structure, that's what will allow you to generate clients on demand, charge premium prices, and gain market share while doing it, right? And it can be done. And I know I make note of this, regardless of if it is you or not you in the consult room, meaning either another attorney, a paralegal, or non-attorney salesperson, right? Checklist selling is what allows us to actually have the practical implementation of a repeatable sales structure in the consult room. Okay, so we'll talk about the structure around this. Yeah, so a few things. When, when you look at checklist selling as a whole, it's, it's got to accomplish a few things. You've got to build a connection with the prospect. Uh, you've got to provide value while doing it. And you've got to invite them to take the next steps with your firm, taking action, right? And so when you're looking at the basic building blocks of a structure, again, ours is the 19 steps. But when you are looking at building a structure, um, you've got to make sure you're setting expectations for how the consultation is going to run. So that way, no one's in the dark. Uh, you've got to demonstrate and learn about the prospect and their story. Actually give them an outlet. They've got a problem that likely they haven't been able to share with anyone. And they want an outlet to share that. And you and need to be that sounding board. This is where that heaven and hell come into play, right? This exactly. is where that, they're talking about the heaven and their, their hell and what their heaven, they, what they wish their heaven looked like, correct? Exactly. They're talking about, bingo, they're talking about what they're going through right now. And we have to find a way to learn what their heaven looks like, right? Then you have to give them some paths, right? You've got to give them options for moving forward. You, you need to give them some action items and how your firm operates, what you've done and how you can serve them. And then you've got to provide them peace of mind, giving them a demonstration um, that they are going to be able to go into your firm. They're going to be satisfied with the service you're, you're providing them. And lastly, and the most important part of this structure is you have to, have to, have to invite them to take the next step with your firm. None of this is good if you don't actually give them an invitation to take the next step with your firm. Yeah. So let's talk about this a little bit, right? So, um, so this idea of checklist selling. So what, I, what, what drives me crazy about um, all the other sales trainers out there in the world is 
either they they try to convince you that you need to customize every single sales call for each case and be uniquely qualified for every situation. You and I both know that's a fail. Uh, or they, they say to you, they have some acronym or structure that they think you should use, but they're meaningless. Like, like even if we go like, so let, let me use yours as a, as a point, as a case in point. So go back to this. Look, you said set expectations, learn about the prospect and their story, heaven and hell, discuss their options and how the firm works um, so they get to choose, provide peace of mind, letting them know what's going to happen and invite them to na- take the next step, right? And so this sounds like almost like a checklist. But you and I both know from doing this, the problem is there are so many little nuances inside of here mm-hmm. that, that, yeah, you could get maybe you could get away with building a structure like this and, and have yeah. it work a little bit. Mm-hmm. But the, the magic, the magic of using checklist selling where you break it down by point by point by point mm-hmm. is that you actually get to go and go, no, no, okay, inside of this, there are four little steps. I need you to do this step and this step and this step and this step. And so rather than leaving it up to the talent of the individual, you literally write and build a script and a structure that follows these steps so that when somebody is on the phone and then you review that call, you can literally score it and go check, 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 check. And that means that they, that means they got it done. And if they get it done, they're more likely to close the deal, right? That's exactly right. Okay, so th- so for me, you know, I-, I know we're not going into the 19 steps in depth here, but those five things that we just gave them is essential. They can start there. So if they don't have the 19 steps, by the way, if you're a Partners Club member, the 19 steps are on the dashboard. You can grab them. They're already outlined for you. If you're not a Partners Club member, Mike will probably teach you how to reach out to him later, and you can learn more about the 19 steps. But regardless, what you need to be committed to is is this idea that we're going to go into checklist selling. So tell me uh, a story about somebody who didn't use checklist selling before and now uses it now and what the result difference is. Yeah, so I'll I'll, I'll use an example of uh, exactly what the the title of this webinar was, which is uh, Attorney James Jones out out of uh, Tacoma, Washington, an estate planning attorney. See, when, when I originally met James, um, he did not have a repeatable structure. He was customizing each consultation, and he certainly had no checklist to follow when going through the consultation. Um, when we had had a conversation, he, he was open and receptive to the idea of, okay, maybe checklist selling is worth a try. Maybe there's something to this, right? He wanted to be able to consistently retain more clients and do it, like I said, at a consistent rate. Um, so, When he decided to take that leap into the program to be able to build out checklist selling, to have that repeatable structure, uh, he was originally, like the Graftons, at about a 55% close rate. Um, And then after six weeks, literally six weeks, uh, he was consistently closing at 84%, 84%, and closing uh, an additional $158,744 in gross sales in only six weeks. That number has only continued to climb. Uh, More impressively, just to break it down into an annual stat, uh, that's $1.352 million in additional gross sales as a result of him implementing checklist selling and having a repeatable structure in place. Okay, so James is a happy guy. Um, I'd say. Yeah, so, okay, so what, what, what I find really interesting there is so estate planning. So mm-hmm. what I know about estate planning attorneys, not, be, not only because I've worked with them for so many years, but I also, you know, have my own, they, they, they love to be precise, right? Because what they do, the, their language in their contracts really matters, right? It, makes, it may, can make a huge difference in the settlement of an estate or in the event of some sort of litigation later on. And so they, they, they have, they realize what they do has to be done correctly. And so they're very, they pay close attention to each individual situation, which means they're susceptible to in the consult room wanting to customize, right? Which is makes complete sense that James would have wanted to customize in the consult room because that's what, 
that's what he wants to do in his practice area, right? Yeah. Um, and so, but yet, for whatever reason, he saw this as an opportunity, and he was able to put aside his normal tendencies and follow the structure and the script to the word, to the letter, and now he's realized, realizing this increase. So uh, congratulations to James, and congratulations to you for, for helping him understand that. Okay, so so let's recap where we are right now. So we've, sure. we've covered um, so far uh, th this idea that they've got to get their mindset right. What did you call that? Uh, just implementing a repeatable structure, a repeatable okay, so sales system. The, the mindset around I implementing the repeatable structure or repeatable system. The, the second one was getting the price right, right? What did you yep. call that? Command premium pricing. Command premium pricing. Okay, so they got a command premium pricing. And then the third was checklist selling correct the secret weapon yep checklist selling. all right so i think it's fair to say that if they did these three things they would see some results would you agree absolutely but would you also agree that it's not the total story right so what i love Certainly. is you 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 identified two additional shifts that i think are important for us to get to we only have about 13 minutes left but I, I want to get to them because because I think they're important. So let's talk about these two additional shifts you identified. The sure. fourth was leverage your time. So mm -hmm. what are you finding when you're talking to attorneys about leveraging their time? Yeah. So uh, a couple of things, obviously leveraging your time. So disconnecting your time from gross sales, um, understanding you, you are the best at what you do. So focus on doing that right if you are the best in your practice area and actually practicing the law why not focus your time on solely being the best at practicing that area of law right see as, as all, opposed to trying to be the best salesperson in the world exactly it, it you know it, of, of course it, it you know we want to be the best at everything we do right um but that's not the best use of our time and most of the firms i have worked with have how found ways to ultimately scale their time um, and generate the same, if not better results by leveraging their time. And when I say leveraging their time, I mean hiring either an attorney or a non-attorney salesperson to run consultations. That's by far the fastest way to leverage yourself because I know that many of these attorneys, the only way you're going to generate new business is if you have consultations. And that means if you don't have someone else running those consultations, that is you in those consultations which then takes away your time to, well, on a grand scale, focus on, on the business instead of being in the business, right? And so the quickest way to, uh, you know, kind of free yourself and remove yourself from that role and focus in on what you're good at doing, what you're the best at doing is to hire someone to replace yourself in that role, either an attorney or a non-attorney salesperson. Yeah, so let's talk about the reason why they fear that, right? So I think the reason why they fear that is because the first and foremost, they're afraid that if they, they're the, nobody could replace them. Like they're afraid that because, because well, m many of them believe, oh, it would take me so long to train somebody because they don't know uh, all the different things about every different case law and all of the little nuances, because they believe that what's supposed to happen in the consult room is they're supposed to give advice. Would you agree with that? The common thing that you hear from them all the time? Yeah, that's a common trend. Do you, so to be clear, should they be giving advice in the consult room? Absolutely not. You mean the there's consult... not a check, there's not a check box that says give advice. Absolutely not. The goal of the consult room is to get the prospect to retain the firm so that we can solve their problem. Okay. So, so the, the, so what I find when I, when I work with attorneys to try to convince them to do this, they then think, well, I can't afford to hire somebody to replace me in that particular role. And when I ask them why they can't afford it, Oftentimes we find there's two fundamental flaws. The first is they're not charging enough. Mm -hmm. And so they don't have the profitability to be able to afford somebody. And the second is because they don't have a system structure checklist done, they don't have all the things we've talked about so far, they're not converting at the highest possible rate. So we're not retaining as many clients as we should, and we're not retaining them at the highest possible level. If, and, pardon me, at the highest possible price. 
And I'll also add, if you don't have a repeatable structure and you want to replace yourself, it's real hard to extract the knowledge that comes out of your head and put it into someone else's with no structure in place. You're basically throwing them in the room and say, make it happen. Whereas if you have a structure in place, it doesn't matter who you have that comes into that room. As long as they're competent, have some sales experience, you could place them in, they follow the structure, they have a complete checklist on following step by step and can maximize the results in that room. So, so okay. Um, you know, at this point, some of the people listening or watching live, whatever, might be thinking to themselves, man, this just sounds like a bunch of work or whatever. I, wouldn't it be just easier if I go like um, generate more leads so that I can just get more clients or, or maybe what Rich teaches and just set more appointments uh, so that we get more people to meet with? Like, why is it so important to pay attention to this? you know, the, the, the consultation, why is that like the most important thing to pay attention to in your opinion? Cause, cause you're passionate about this. Yeah. I have a very strong stance on this. And the stance is I believe before anything else in your firm, you need to fix your hire rate, especially when you bring up the conversation of, well, why don't I just go get more leads first? I'm going to go as far as to say that if you don't have a good hire rate um, based off of where you have the capability of being and you decide you want to go add more leads, I would say, number one, that's like a sin. Because what does that ultimately do? Well, you're closing at 30%, right? And then you go add more leads because you feel if you add more leads, you'll increase the amount of clients you retain. In theory, you will, right? Because you're just going to increase the number of uh, leads that come through, which is going to increase the number of appointments that come through. However, if you don't fix your hire rate, now you just did all of this work to go add a bunch of leads into the funnel to still only close at 30%. Whereas if you took that 30% and you made it 65, 70%, now you fix your hire rate. Now you go add a bunch of leads at the top of the funnel. And rather than burning through a bunch of leads because you were closing at 30%, now you're taking all of those new leads and closing at 65, 70%. I believe that everything starts with fixing your hire rate. I, I like to see the fire. That's good. That's good. It's, you're, you're, you're my kid. I can tell. That's good. All right. Uh, so I agree with you. I mean, I agree with you. I think it's, I think, I think the one, here's the one challenge and, and I'll throw this challenge at you. Oftentimes, so oftentimes attorneys, when we're talking about fixing the hire rate, they don't really want to replace themselves. So they, they either like meeting with clients. And so that's what they want at prospects and that's what they want to do. Um, or, 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 and, and, or uh, they, they actually believe their hire rate is better than it actually is. Right. So they, they have a false impression of what their hire rate actually is. Mm -hmm. um, and, and to fix the hire rate, we're telling them, you know, in a, in a difficult way that we're telling a really intelligent human being that's worked their tail off to always be the smartest guy or gal in the room that in this particular instance, they're wrong and we need to fix them. And that could be a humbling thing. And so that's sure. the only challenge. So, so what do you run up against when you're telling them, okay, you don't want to hire somebody else. You want to get, you, I, we got to fix you. How do you get through that? Like, how do you break through that scenario with them? Yeah, I, it, and it is tough, right? And it is a humbling experience. Um, you got to come at it from, I, I hate to be so logical, but from a logical approach in some capacities, because it's like, listen, by not fixing you, you're leaving a lot of opportunity on the table. You're going through the hell per se, that there is absolutely a solution to be able to overcome to see the heaven of the other side. So we have to sit down and take a logical approach and say, okay, this is something we have to fix to be able to get to that other side. And so I, I you know, I, I think it's important to, to reframe the mindset to understand that, yeah, it may not be fun to look in the mirror and humble yourself in that regard. But I would also say that you could be the bottleneck that's holding you back from growth. That's okay. holding you back from getting to the other side of the pain. Yeah, for sure. Okay. We've got about five, six minutes left. We'll go through the last stage here. And then yeah. just if anybody's questions, I mean, Michael and I'll stick around a couple minutes longer to answer any questions. Just use the chat. Um, we'll answer any questions you might happen to have. Let's share this last concept. This fifth shift is invest yeah. in training. Now, I want to be clear, this isn't a pitch for you. You believe that yeah. whether you're using a third party service or you're in doing this in-house, this is something yep. that has to be done, correct? Absolutely. 
Yeah. So, so let's talk about that. What what does this what does this look like? Yeah. So regardless of who it is, what it is, every firm should have consistent sales training. It is the lifeblood of what allows your firm to have consistent business coming through the doors. And training brings two key things. One, a repeatable structure, hopefully, right? Depending on who you decide to use and how you decide to implement. Two, accountability. And I'm sure that you've probably got ideas in your head right now after listening to this training that wouldn't have been here if you didn't make the time for this training, right? The real question that it comes down to is how happy are you in your law firm, right? If you're happy, uh, okay, that's one thing. That's good. But if you're not happy and you'd like to see change, you need a new mindset, you need a plan, and you need accountability. Ultimately, that boils down to you need training, right? You need consistent training. You could flip to the, the next slide there too. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. And, and so when we look at this from a holistic approach at, as a whole, you went to school, right? Law school. Uh, you were in school for seven to eight years to become the best of the best at what you do. You were in training in law school, right? You got training to be the best at what you do. Trying to implement everything we just discussed today, repeatable structure, commanding premium prices, checklist selling, leveraging your time and doing it all without training is in some cases a ludicrous thought, right? I, I know I personally invested money on training every single time. It was a big decision. I understood. I knew it's, it's not something to take lightly, right? Um, granted, every single time that investment had paid for itself within month one, right? The, the key here is don't go at it alone. Find the best trainer out there. doesn't matter who it is, who you feel, whether it's me, whether it's someone else, and invest what it takes to work with them. Get this fixed. Get the higher rate fixed. Implement the five shifts. And it's going to take training to actually successfully do that. Yeah. So um, when we talk about that real quick, you know, when we're talking about this training, I mean, it's, it's having somebody that can um, be able to pull a call and score it, uh, give advice on what's actually happening in the call, and, and then be able to have the opportunity to build a weekly training based on what happens live on calls. And then, and then fundamentally get, have this structure where people can have a place where they can ask their questions. And, and that's how they should set it up in their office, whether they hire a firm like yours or somebody else. But there's a big caution here. And we don't have time to go into a big, long story. And I don't know if you have permission to use their name. So we're not going to use their name. But I know of a firm who, in the last couple of months, hired you uh, because they were working with another sales training company, right? So yep. this is a big warning. You can get this wrong. There are sales training companies out there who really don't know what they're doing. They claim they know what they're doing, but they actually don't know what they're doing. And they're very dangerous for you. And so, um, and so you had one of these firms that were using this company. And, and I think as the story goes, well, why, why don't you tell the story? Don't use any names because I don't know we yeah, have permission sure. to do that. But yeah, tell I, a story. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, they were using a different sales trainer. They thought that things were going pretty well, um, but evidently not well enough to the point where they were completely satisfied, right? So they decided to take the leap, jump into the program and give it a shot. They started the program at 40% and they were utilizing all of the techniques that that additional sales trainer was giving them. And they were following them to what they said, right? But they were only closing at 40%. They jumped into the program within 30 days, they jumped up to 69.09%. It no. makes a difference when you have the right sales training. Yeah, and, it, and, and again, the, the person they were listening to before believed in customizing a unique situation for every single time, as opposed to developing a closed loop system that uses checkbox selling, right? That's and correct. Or checklist selling. So, so again, getting the right training and installing the right training for your staff in your firm, whether you do that in-house on your own or you, or you do that with a third party is vital, but just make sure they're being congruent with what we've been talking about here today, because this is the formula that works best. All right, we've come to the end of the, end of the rope here. Let's go ahead and give them the opportunity to know how to get to know you more, Michael, if they have questions or they want it to, um, they want to. So you talked about a few things today. What did you talk about? Yeah, uh, we, you know, today I, I revealed how to generate clients on demand while being able to remove yourself from the console room, leveraging your time, right? How to command a premium price uh, for your service and why you should stop losing profitability and undercharging, right? Uh, leveraging your time and most importantly, how to do this all without giving up your time to fulfill work, 
get home for dinner and uh, without feeling overwhelmed all the time. Yeah. And so they need these five things to win and the five shifts, right? Yep. You need the five shifts to win. Um, and, and these alone are enough to help you generate clients on demand while regaining your freedom. Cool. Um, so if they have a choice and they want to learn how to work with you, what happens? Yeah. If, if you guys would like to, uh, my, my team and I, we, we've set aside t- some time in the next 48 hours. Uh, to speak with you personally about how you can take what we discussed today and apply it to your business. Um, And obviously, whatever the challenges you're facing are, I could almost promise you I've seen it and and I know how to help you overcome it. Okay, cool. Um, So what will you do together if you guys start having this conversation? Yeah, yeah, uh, on our conversation, uh, we're going to work to create a a step-by-step game plan of generating clients on demand, how to help you do that, and how to help you regain your freedom by leveraging your time, right? What we discussed today, the five shifts, the cost, absolutely free. But why would you do it for like free? Like, why would you, why would you go through that process? Yeah, uh, well, good question. Uh, One, as you can tell by the passion, I love doing this, right? I love being able to help uh, law firm owners get out of their current position, wherever it may be, and achieve freedom in their firms. Plus, I understand that we went over a lot of detail today in these five shifts, and you might want our help to transform your sales process. And if so, we're going to need to have a discussion on how we can create a game plan to do it and if it's a good fit for both of us. Uh, and if not, no worries, no hard feelings. Good. Okay, so where, where do you want them to go if they're interested? Is this the yeah, URL? If- yeah, if you are interested in, in chatting through this, uh, like I said, we've got time and spaces reserved within the next 48 hours. You can go to the closingroom.com backslash discovery. Uh, we did cap spaces, so they are limited. So I do encourage you to go snag a, a, a spot if you have an opportunity to do so. Um, but that is the closingroom.com backslash discovery. Cool. I think Brittany put it in the chat for you. So it doesn't Thank look like you, we Preston. have any questions. Um, Preston, sounds like you said good points all the way around. Thanks, Preston. Appreciate Thank that. Thank you, Preston. Um, Michael, you know, from me to you as your dad, I'm super proud of you. Um, you you're 23 years old and, and stood in front of a bunch of school learned attorneys, and you, you uh, educated them on what works and, and watching you perform and, and helping attorneys really make a difference in their practice and their lives has, has warms my heart. So Appreciate you giving it your all and being passionate about it and really deep diving into this. I appreciate you giving your time today uh, and mm-hmm. sharing a different view, this, this five shifts perspective, rather than just diving into the 19 steps and actually letting them see that from a 30,000 foot view. Um, so thank you for being with us today. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, come on and, and be able to share the five shifts. You're welcome. All right, so everybody, uh, I hope that you enjoyed this time together. Um, I know I always do. I love talking about sales. Obviously, I love being with my son and talking about this subject. Um, Whether you've just experienced Hanukkah or you're about to go into Christmas uh, and or the new year, we wish you a happy holiday season. Um, I will and my firm will be off the last week in December through January, but we'll be back strong in the beginning of the year, ready to race into 2022. And I hope you enjoyed this session, helping you build your practice better one sales system at a time. Thanks so much, everybody. Make it a great day. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. I hope you learned something about a system that you could put into your law firm so you can build that law firm that supports your lifestyle rather than undermine your lifestyle. I hope that you feel like you're part of our community we call Entrepreneurial Attorney Nation. If you'd like to learn more about what we do around here, the best way to get started is to go ahead and go to our website, therichardjames.com. That's therichardjames.com and request a free copy of one of our books so that you can take the next step in learning how we can help you build your practice better one system at a time.